Hi everyone, I'm Anya Parampil and you're watching Redlines. The trial of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange started this week in the United Kingdom. On Monday, February 24th, a UK court began hearing arguments in favor of Assange's extradition to the United States, where he faces charges under the Espionage Act. The burden of his defense is to prove that not only does the political nature of his case violate the U.S.-U.K. extradition agreement, but also that his health and even life will be in danger if he is handed over to U.S. custody. This case is easily the most important trial many of us will see in our lifetime, especially those of us concerned with the rights of journalists in the United States and around the world. Yet, shockingly, very few U.S. media outlets, if any at all, are giving Assange's trial the coverage it deserves. Thankfully, Kevin Gostola, an editor with Shadowproof Media, has been in London all week covering the trial. He joined Redlines just a few moments ago. Kevin Gasola, thank you so much for making time to speak with me today. Kevin, of course, is the an editor at Shadowproof Media and also hosts a podcast, Unauthorized Disclosure, with our good friend Ronnie Akalik. He's been in London all week covering the trial of WikiLeaks founder and editor Julian Assange. And Kevin, I know one question on everyone's mind is how Assange looks at the moment. You're one of the few people in the world who's actually been able to see him because you've been in court. Does he look healthy? I think most people who watch him would say that he's not the same person that he was multiple years ago. You know, the toll of being in the Ecuador embassy shows, the toll of being held in this detention and not being out on bail shows the effect of being put through a security regime on a daily basis, particularly this week. We heard about how when he is going to court, he's moved around, he's subjected to strip searches, he is handcuffed several times during the day, he has his papers taken from him without explanation by the security guards, he's put in one cell, then moved to a second cell. I think in one entire span of a day, he was moved around between five different cells, which seems clearly intended to disorient Julian Assange and and make it difficult for him to feel like he's ever in some kind of familiar surroundings while he's in the courthouse. And so what we have seen this past week is that Julian Assange is struggling mentally in order to keep up with what's happening in the case. There was a request made to the judge to have Julian Assange be allowed to sit with his attorneys because one of the issues is that he is having trouble hearing and and, and following the proceedings as they unfolded in this extradition hearing. And the judge denied this request mm-hmm even though it's a standard throughout the world to allow the defendant to be with their attorneys, even though when defendants who have been kept in some dock are having trouble hearing when they have some kind of thing that is getting in the way of their participation, usually the judge sees it as a a mechanism of relief, a, a remedy to allow a defendant to come have access to their attorneys. And, you know, maybe that'll come up more in our conversation, but I say that goes to his health and the way he looks and how things are going for Julian Assange, because I don't know if five or 10 years ago, he would have been in this predicament where he really does need to have a a special attention so that he can follow along with the proceedings. We certainly will discuss some of the concerns about the communication he's been able to have with his lawyers later in the conversation. But I was wondering if you could give us a breakdown of the court proceedings this week, which have now officially come to a close. Start with laying out the prosecution's case against Assange. The prosecution's case is, well, first of all, let me backtrack. The defense has the burden, and I think they said so during the hearing, to show why 
Julian Assange should not be extradited to the United States. So for the most part, the prosecution gets to put forward their basic arguments for why he should be extradited, but it's up to the defense to rebut those and show that what they're doing is unfair, improper, or that the extradition is based on inaccurate facts as they are being alleged against Julian Assange. And so the prosecution, primarily what we're hearing from, and his name is James Lewis, primarily what we're hearing from James Lewis is that the prosecution believes the U.S.-U.K. extradition treaty does not apply to Julian Assange's extradition. And this is slightly complicated, kind of convoluted, but I know that if you hear this example, there may instantly be something that pops into your head in the United States where you've heard this kind of uh, weedy, uh, overscrupulous argument made in order to justify doing something to someone that constitutes a human rights abuse, twisting the law, manipulating it in such a way so that it gives the prosecution a license to have their way with a defendant. And in particular, they are saying that because the UK Extradition Act in 2003 does not contain a political offense exception because it did not include that, but it's in the US-UK Extradition Treaty, well then, only domestic law matters in these proceedings, so they're going to ignore the US-UK extradition treaty, and they're going to focus on the domestic law. They're going to take refuge in that and and try and convince the judge that she should only focus on domestic law. And because the political offense exception is not in this law, and this is like really kind of a weedy argument here, but because it's not in this law, then... Julian Assange should be allowed to come to the United States. And then let me pull out here and say a political offense exception means that the defense is saying that he is accused of committing political offenses, meaning they say he dumped state secrets. It was against the interests of the United States. That's a political offense. And it's a standard recognized universally throughout the world in many of these extradition treaties that you do not extradite people for political offenses. Uh, and, and this is to protect against states going after uh, each other's country's dissidents and trying to you know, prosecute them. And it's, it's, it's a way of having some semblance of respect of human rights built into the extradition treaties that exist around the world. It's part of the UN model treaty. Interpol has political offenses exceptions, and the U.S. has actually stood behind having a political offense exception, even as they start, sought to create carve-outs in it around the war on terrorism so that they could extradite people from the uh, from the U.K. and other countries who were accused of terrorism offenses without having to deal with a defense where someone will come forward and say, well, no, I committed this act of violence in the name of political resistance to, let's say, you know, United States foreign policy or something like that. And in fact, I think that's what is at play here. We've we've seen Craig Murray, who is a former diplomat, and, and, and there's others who have pointed to the reason why the UK Extradition Act did not have the political offense exception anymore is because the United States was going around and saying, you need to remove from this treaty, this exception, because it makes it harder for us to extradite terrorists or mm. terrorism detainees from the UK. So now it's impacting Julian Assange in a way that was never intended when this was passed. And I think it would be really news to people in Britain to find out that the people who are making these arguments, the, the prosecutor and then the judge who seems rather receptive to this argument, believe that this treaty does not apply to them. And, and that creates a kind of deprivation of rights. It opens up the possibility of arbitrary detention, and it gives the prosecutors a lot of freedom to handle this case in a way that allows for abuse in extradition. 
There are essentially two competing extradition laws here, correct? There's the domestic UK law and then the international treaty actually between the United States and the UK. That is the tension in the court, though we've seen even recently in the United States with the case of the embassy protectors, the Venezuela embassy protectors, that we actually had a court, a judge in a U.S. court say essentially international law doesn't apply here. We're only looking at U.S. law and of course in the U.K., context, the UK domestic law happens to favor the interests of the United States. Yeah, I think that's a good example because we're talking about something that should be upheld by the judge because she is a lawyer herself. She is part of the bar, uh, some bar association, I imagine. She's part of some lawyers society. And this is a community, a global community. And all of them would probably claim to care about international law. And and yet, not only is she entertaining this argument from the prosecutors that for perhaps this treaty is not something that should be applied, and, and it's, it's ludicrous. As the defense made clear, the only reason that Julian Assange can be extradited to the United States is because there is a formal agreement and a treaty between the United States and the UK and it's been ratified in the United States. Uh, oddly enough, I don't think it's been ratified in the UK yet, but the UK has a process for doing this kinds of an extradition. It had it signed this treaty with the United States, so it has a force to it. And the very basis of trying to bring Julian Assange to the United States is built around what is permissible in this treaty. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's that simple. It's remarkable also because we have this idea that judges are impartial, that they honor the law, but we know from our experience here, Kevin, that judges are actually very political, especially with some of these high profile cases. Am I correct in understanding that the prosecution has also argued that people were actually hurt or even killed maybe as a result of WikiLeaks publishing these documents, although that's never been actually proven. There's a component of the allegations against Julian Assange in the indictment that points to his recklessness that says that, you know, not only is he accused of soliciting this information, uh, but he is also accused of endangering lives when he published the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs that he put informants and or confidential human sources at risk, that he put activists that were working with the United States government or the U.S. military at risk, that he put uh, people who you know, should not have been in jeopardy at risk. And I think one aspect of these proceedings that's worth mentioning for your viewers is that people... Uh, sorry, for the first time, the prosecutors got very specific about the kinds of allegations they wanted to make against Julian Assange. And they, they mentioned specific documents that they were going to charge against him in order to pursue this extradition. So now we know, uh, I, I don't know the exact documents, I haven't been able to pull them up, but we had years given. We were informed that some of this involved China or Syria or Iran that they believe that the cables that were disclosed put individuals at risk that were working. And you'll notice those countries that I just named are all adversaries of the United States. They're considered countries that are hostile to the U.S. They're, co they're countries that we have policies that directly oppose those countries. And then there was the issue of the war logs and how there were... Uh, documents uh, that were that were disclosed that revealed people who were uh, helping the military, like like they had come in and handed over weapons to co coalition forces in order to help them fight insurgents. So that is an aspect of the prosecution's case that wasn't in the initial indictment, but this past week they they got specific about what they were saying. But then we can pull back and and maybe as we pivot over to the defense, discuss how the prosecution believes that Julian Assange was responsible for putting these lives at risk and completely ignores the kinds of harm minimization, 
procedures that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks had when reporting the collaboration they had with mm -hmm. media organizations like The Guardian, Der Spiegel, mm -hmm. as well as The New York Times. Um, the fact that they were using cryptophones and encryption to protect these documents. They had very strict procedures for how to handle the documents so they did not spill out onto the internet. And this is completely disregarded by the United States uh, in, in prosecuting ex, uh, Julian Assange. Kevin, you mentioned the cases of Iran and China. I know just in recent years, both of those countries have arrested individuals who they say were U.S. intelligence operatives in their countries. I don't know if these are the cases the prosecution is talking about when they blame Assange or WikiLeaks uh, for endangering lives, but it's hard to see how instances now could be connected to to publications by WikiLeaks years ago. But I want to ask you about how the defense is opposing these allegations. What exactly is their argument? Their argument is an abuse of process argument. And they're, they, they have a very limited ability to contest the extradition. But, but what they can do is they can say that they believe that the way that the prosecution is pursuing this is unfair. And they can also argue that the allegations against Julian Assange, as they are put forward, are not accurate. And they're presenting a timeline of events and they're presenting a narrative that does not match what the prosecution is saying. They're saying that they deliberately are leaving out aspects of what happened between Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning, who of course was the US Army whistleblower, who was the source of these documents that we're talking about that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks obtained and then published in 2010 and 2011. And in this abuse of process, argument they're walking through these kinds of issues that I've been talking about a little bit like uh, this idea that people's lives were endangered when they published these documents. Uh, they're going through this idea that the prosecution is hostile to Julian Assange and, and that they have had that in the United States there have been people who are from both parties the Republican and the Democratic Party but also parts of the executive branch that have spoken out against Julian Assange, that have as ascribed motives to Julian Assange that suggests that he's just motivated by animus towards the United States. You know, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo calling WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence agency. Now, how can you expect to be given a fair trial in the United States if people who run the government in the Trump administration have talked like this? Uh, we had a very clear example put on the record of a claim that the defense is probably going to flesh out more in an upcoming evidentiary hearing. But the 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 allegation was that Donald Trump, with Dana Rohrabacher, a former congressman, and then Chuck Johnson, who's this far right activist slash journalist who met with Julian Assange, that they had this meeting and they made an offer to Trump, uh, sorry, they made this offer on behalf of Trump, suggesting that if you could give us some information and say very clearly to us that Russia was not the source of the emails that were published from the DNC, then we would consider giving you some kind of a pardon, working out some kind of an arrangement so you could leave the Ecuador embassy. This meeting took place in 2017. Uh, well before he was indicted, and this is a this is a manipulation or an abuse of the Justice Department of Power. The threat of prosecution is being used to extort something that Donald Trump would like to have in order to help him in a battle with Democrats. Who you know, as much as I have problems with the way they've made these allegations around RussiaGate and how there's a lot of there's a lack of basis to what they argue. The fact is that you know, you can't abuse the power of the Justice Department and say, okay, give me something and then I can promise you that we're not going to prosecute you. That's not what is supposed to be done with the Justice Department yeah. uh, in order to, to try to obtain something for your own personal benefit. Yeah, we've heard- work. 
Yeah, and we've also heard in recent days there was a reporting, at, re, there was reporting in Politico that Richard Grinnell, who is a new intelligence chief, also has somebody buddy linked to him who had a meeting with uh, Julian Assange, who, who who was likely working in a, some capacity to make it possible for Julian Assange to be kicked out of the embassy. Uh, that there might have been some kind of wheeling and dealing going on behind the scenes uh, that would be in service to the Trump administration. Essentially what it is, Anya, is that Jeff Sessions was the man responsible for reopening this case against Julian Assange. And this was also something that was part of the defense's argument, saying that as much as Barack Obama's administration was engaged in the war on whistleblowers, in 2013, we know from reporting that the Justice Department hit a wall and they made a decision based on what they knew about their ability to prosecute individuals and based upon what they knew about how the law should apply to everyone, that if they were going to prosecute Julian Assange, then they would be opening up this can of worms where they would then be obligated to go after journalists at the New York Times and at other outlets in the United States that had published the WikiLeaks documents. And so they stopped. And this was reported as the New York Times problem. It was covered in the Washington Post as such. And so that's important because what the defense is arguing is that this case is entirely politicized. You have one administration that says don't prosecute. Then you have a bunch of people who come into power who hate leakers, amazingly, even more so than Barack Obama hates leakers, wants to, you know, put nooses around their necks and string them up in public squares. I think Trump has even talked about that in the open and on Twitter, being very vengeful about it. Jeff Sessions has never been any friend to the press, never believed in transparency, despite the way the resistance, uh, and I hashtag resistance, but despite the way that they have talked about Jeff Sessions as some kind of victim of the Trump administration. Uh, And so this is political. What they're doing to Julian Assange to bring this case is political. It's not about pursuing any kind of crimes. These are these are 10 year old, nearly 10 year old offenses. And as time goes on, I mean, that's part of the issue as well, is it's unfair to Julian Assange 10 years later. It's unfair to Chelsea Manning, too, 10 years later, because how can you recollect what really happened 10 years on when it's just so far removed? What concerns have Assange and his legal team raised about their ability to even build a defense? I know it hasn't been the easiest for them in that courtroom. They're tremendously concerned about their ability to raise a defense because the prosecution is is constantly saying, okay, yeah, you may be putting this on the record, but it's irrelevant to whether or not Julian Assange should be extradited. And, And the judge was constantly challenging the defense in ways that the that were favorable to the prosecution, uh, seemingly agreeing that, well, tell me why this is relevant. I mean, this happened with the political offense exception, which is troubling because that's going to be very key to Julian Assange's ability to possibly show that uh, this is something that should not go forward, that the extradition should not go forward. And so They wanted to put forward a very basic argument about what political offenses were, compare the history of these cases where political offenses had led to extraditions being rejected. And then they wanted to say, you know, there are similarities with Assange's case and to highlight those for the judge. And the judge stopped the defense and said, well, no, I want to know why this is relevant at all. Because, you know, as we talked about earlier in this interview, It's not in the Extradition Act. It's not in UK domestic law. It was removed from statutory law in the United Kingdom. So that's what they're up against. They're up against a lot of. So she's already making it very clear that she's pretty much going to default to the domestic law as opposed to the international treaty. Yeah, she's very clear about how she's probably going to take refuge in this as a way to avoid avoid challenging the authority. I, I certainly get the sense as an observer of these proceedings that a lot of what is happening is going through the motions. Mm-hmm. And the defense is going to put forward 
as much evidence as they can get on the record. They're going to make as many arguments as they can in the extradition proceedings. When we get to May and June, they're going to call witnesses. Uh, I haven't mentioned yet the very important bombshell evidence that they have to present to all of us in the world related to Undercover Global, this Spanish security company mm -hmm. that was conducting an espionage operation against the Ecuador embassy. But we're going to see witnesses called during the upcoming extradition hearing, and they're going to talk about the violation of Julian Sanchez's privacy rights while he was in the embassy, the way in which the Ecuador government, when Lenin Moreno became the right-wing leader of that country and Rafael Correa was no longer running the country, the man who did grant asylum to Julian Assange was no longer there to be an ally and supporter of the institution of asylum. And then this pressure campaign ramped up against Julian Assange to force him out of the embassy. They're going to, to talk about all of this evidence they're going to bring forward evidence of how he was targeted when he was having lawyer meetings inside of even the women's bathroom. I mean, they knew that they were being eavesdropped and spied upon. And so they went so far as to have meetings in the women's bathroom. And even that wasn't good enough because there was a microphone there. And what we've heard in the past week related to this was that, and I know that this was already reported out in U.S. media, but it's really flown under the radar. So just to refresh people's memory and also to maybe introduce it, if you didn't hear, there was a trip that David Morales, the owner of UC Global, took to the United States. He went to Las Vegas to a security trade fair. He met with Sheldon Adelson and he got a contract there to do security for Sheldon Adelson's yacht. Of course, Sheldon Adelson is this oligarch who has bankrolled Republicans and also is one of the biggest major donors to President Donald Trump. Now, while he was here in the U.S., he also got a side contract to work for U.S. intelligence in conducting a spy operation against the embassy to target Julian Assange. And so he went back over to the country of, of the United Kingdom um, or, or he went back across the pond to Spain, and uh, then this operation unfolded over a, a short amount of time, and it, it ramped up. They put mics in different places. They were collecting the data from them. Every, every 14 days, they were you know, removing these. They were uploading data to the servers, and uh, U.S. intelligence agents or analysts had access to this material where they could download it from a remote server. There were discussions, and this is where it got out of control. I mean, not that it doesn't already sound like this it shouldn't be going on. It is already so absurd. All, it, I can't believe this was it, allowed to happen. And it, and and but there were people who recognized that it was getting even worse. Like, this was bad enough. This should have never been allowed for a security company to do. We can agree on that. But Anya, it got even worse because there are whistleblowers from the company who are going to testify about how conversations escalated and they could tell David Morales had completely lost all sense of what was right and what was wrong and was willing to do whatever to please the CIA. And so there were discussions about kidnapping Julian Assange from the embassy. We heard things in the court about maybe leaving the door open in the Ecuador embassy just randomly. You know, hey, it's an accident. We, we're sorry. We just left the door open. And then some people could slip in and snatch Julian and remove him from the Ecuador embassy. We heard talks about poisoning. You know, it, it reminds you of, and I know this has been in the news in the last week, we've been hearing again about people getting worked up over Fidel Castro in Cuba. This is how the CIA wanted to target Fidel Castro, to like poison him with poison cigars and all kinds of other things like that. And it, the CIA, again, like wanted to consider or contemplate some kind of a dirty operation that could allow them to basically kidnap Julian Assange. And I, I, I don't even know, as far as the plan goes, what you would do. Once you have him, where does he go? Are, 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 are you just going to put him on a p private plane and, and bring him back to the United States? Then we're talking about committing rendition of a dissident journalist to bring him back to the United States. And then when you hold him, at that point, he hasn't been indicted. 
So he's being held incommunicado without charge. Just the fact that any of this was ever contemplated is um, incredible. And it leads you to this fair point, because there are many supporters of Julian Assange this past week. If you talk to Kristen Harrison, who is the WikiLeaks found uh, the, the WikiLeaks editor currently, he would tell you that Julian Assange is being treated like a terrorist. And I think that is a fair thing to say. This courthouse where these extradition proceedings are unfolding in Woolwich is a counterterrorism court. It's an anti-terrorism courthouse. It, uh, the glass box that it has that is keeping Julian Assange in the back of the courtroom, that is there because it's for security in case they have terrorism uh, suspects that are on trial that come to these proceedings. They can put them in this glass box and control them. And this is so, another aspect of the yeah. the issue the issue of him not being able to build a case with his prosecu uh, his defense or even speak with his defense goes back to the fact that he's actually being held in the back of a courtroom in what you describe as a glass box and he was at he asked and petitioned to be sitting with his his lawyers and that motion was denied today correct yeah yes exactly as in Thursday um, yeah, on Thursday, his attorneys came uh, forward and said, we would like Julian Assange to be able to sit with us because he does not feel like he can participate. He's very upset because of, as I just described, this espionage operation that was conducted against him. He doesn't have any privacy to talk to his attorneys. He's very sensitive to the fact that these security guards are always close by they could be listening and who knows if they're passing on information to somebody else. He's, he's, he's understandably distrustful. And there are microphones throughout the room, so these conversations might get picked up. There are U.S. government representatives in the room. They might overhear conversations. And there are also, he said, people from the embassy that he recognized from the Ecuador embassy who perhaps wanted him out of the embassy who are there in the room. How does he know that they're not going to turn around and pass on something they overhear to the U.S. government? I should mention now for people who are unaware that he had confidential papers that were in the embassy which were taken by the Ecuador government, seized, stolen essentially, passed on to the United States government. They were not given to the WikiLeaks editor-in-chief, Kristen Harrison, when he requested them. And... They were not given to his family. They were not given to anyone. Uh, his property was taken by the U.S. government to be used against him. And this is someone who was kept in conditions that we know the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Torture and Niels Meltzer have likened to the kind of conditions that induce psychological torture. And that is because, just because for seven years he was not exposed to sunlight on a regular basis because there really wasn't anywhere for him to go. And some of the conditions were actually worse than being in a prison mm -hmm. because he just couldn't move. There's nowhere for you to go. And also the inability to get medical care because some of these things that you need for treatment require large devices. It requires equipment that you would bring into the embassy. That could not be brought in. He was never allowed to leave the embassy to get scans, to have uh, diagnostic procedures run on him to check and make sure that he was well. Uh, he, he needed dental care terribly. So he was under a lot of duress. There was pain and suffering unfolding within the Ecuador embassy for him. And that all manifests itself in these proceedings and the simple request. I can't say this enough. It's a very simple request. Can I sit with my attorney? It happens everywhere throughout the world that you right. are allowed to sit with your attorney. This is part of due process rights to be able to participate in your defense. Mm -hmm. And somehow, I think the judge has it in her head. One of two things. This is, this is just me trying to sort through why the judge would make this decision. You know, one hand, maybe I'm not going to be pushed around by somebody named Julian Assange and told how to conduct my courtroom. This is the procedure and we're going to stick to it. Uh, that you know, that could be one come. That could be one explanation. The second explanation could be 
I'm not going to let Julian Assange sit with his attorneys because I believe he's an unruly fellow and he's going to sit with his attorneys. And then um, from that point on, it's just going to devolve from there. He's going to be disruptive. He might be talking to the press. He might be trying to connect with people in the public gallery. He might be talking with his defense while the prosecutor is giving an argument and be disruptive. When we have Julian Assange in the glass box, we can control Julian Assange and he does not get to disrupt my proceedings. And I think both of these are equally unfair ways to approach the decision to deny somebody the right to participate in their defense. Mm -hmm. And we already know, based on everything you just told us about the level of surveillance he was under during his time in the embassy, the Ecuadorian embassy in London, that the rule of law, any semblance of, of treating Assange fairly or just has gone completely out the door. They're actually talking about assassinating him so, and, and kidnapping him. So when we, we wonder, oh, what did they want to do when they kidnapped him? I wouldn't rule anything out. And that should actually be a pretty large element of the defense's case, as far as I understand. They also have to prove that, and, and that alone should tell you everything you need to know, what you just discussed. They have to prove that he would be in danger if he came to the United States. He could be harmed in prison, and at the very least, he could be denied medical care. That's already happened to other whistleblowers that have been in prison. For example, Jeffrey Sterling, uh, the the CIA uh, uh whistleblower, he was actually denied medical care, not able to have a heart issue treated when he needed it. And so I wouldn't rule any of that out if Assange were to come here. And, and that is a major aspect of the case as well. I'm wondering, Kevin, how are media treated coming in and out of the court? And what kind of media outlets are present? Would you estimate they are mostly British or foreign press? Yeah, well, if I could say something to the point you made about the danger he would be in if brought to the United States, that was something that the defense raised because it's it's a, it's actually common in the UK in defending against an extradition that our prison system, our horrid, terribly unjust system of mass incarceration is invoked in order to say if a detainee or a prisoner is brought over to the United States they are going to be abused and mistreated. You get subject to things like special administrative measures. They're known as SAMs. We also have communications management units in places like Terre Haute, Indiana, where you're just you know not able to communicate with your attorney. Or it's worse than being in solitary confinement. There's even more methods of isolation that are imposed against you. He's as a high profile prisoner someone who gets all of this media attention and is a celebrity, you get treated even worse mm -hmm. in the Bureau of Prisons as a federal prisoner. And that's something that the defense is saying, don't extradite him because in fact, you might be violating conventions on human rights that say that we shouldn't allow someone to be subjected to torture. Solitary confinement is torture. And in order to uphold human rights and guarantee that he is not dehumanized and abused, they would have to deny the extradition. That's part of the defense's argument. As far as media, uh, it, there's been, I'd say, maybe a dozen or so U.S. outlets there. There's definitely many pr British outlets that are there. There is a ton of media from around the world, especially throughout Europe. There are people from Germany. There's, there's outlets from Germany that are there, French outlets. Uh, I think there are Greek um, media there. There's Europe is really taking this case very seriously, as they should, and much more seriously than the United States media, which is unfortunate. There's people from Australia, a few representatives from outlets in Australia, and uh, you know, Stefania Marizzi is a very good journalist who is from Italy, who was there in the at the proceedings. Uh, there and there are people. I mean, I want to stress to you that there are observers there who are right among us, sitting with media, and they are paying attention to the human rights issues. There are human rights observers. There are also people who are MPs from Germany who are concerned about what's happening and traveled to the 
United Kingdom in order to observe the extradition proceedings this past week. And I make that point just to say, do you know anybody who are staffers for members of Congress that traveled to these extradition proceedings to see how their government is prosecuting a journalist under the Espionage Act for the first time and seeking to bring them to to the United States? Yeah, to come to our country. Nope, there aren't any. There there are not. I, I, I am confident in stating here, even though I did not go around to each individual and ask them if they were part of Congress and confirm that they are not, but I am confident in telling you, Anya, that nobody from Congress came over. I mean staffers. I'm not expecting the representatives, but everyone has staff. They have advisors. People could come. Uh, you know, No presidential campaign advisors coming over to see what's happening. Uh, I think there are very limited um, organizations from the U.S. sending people over to observe. You have people who are part of organizations in the UK that are part of human rights organizations, um, you know, the wings of Amnesty International, Reporters Without Borders. Obviously, there are some things to quibble with them about how maybe they've been slow or have been resistant to recognizing Julian Assange as a journalist. I know that's something that the Gray Zone has has covered and gotten into. Uh, but they're there, and I think they deserve credit for being there yeah. and being concerned about the proceedings. And uh, actually, I think what they saw this past week has opened their eyes. A lot of the people who have been in that room who are politicians or part of these human rights groups have been opened up to, well, I'll use the words of Assange supporters, a kangaroo court. uh, They have been opened up to what is going on with him as this is very controlled and the judge is unreasonable in the way in which Julian Assange is managed. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can say that I, I could be mistaken, but I don't think I heard any presidential candidates on the Democratic side make a statement about Assange this week. I'll have to double check that, but I haven't seen anything. And I would really only expect it from Tulsi Gabbard and Senator Sanders. Otherwise, yeah. I think it's a lost cause. Has Assange made any statements in court? And finally, can you tell us where things go from here? What is the next stage in the case? Or the trial, I should say. Assange has made statements. He's not allowed to make statements. The judge interrupts him when he stands up to speak and says he's not allowed unless he is introducing evidence into the extradition proceedings. If he is giving evidence, he could provide testimony. I think he might have to go to, uh, I'm not really sure where he would go if he's, he, I assume he would have to go to a witness box if he is going to testify, but that's not what he's doing. He wants to address the court, and typically I, she claims that that's not allowed, but I know from being here the last few days that there are other defendants who have stood up and addressed the court before and been permitted and allowed. The judge has been, the judges in those other cases have been patient and just Let it happen, even though they don't really want those defendants to be speaking in their courtroom. They just let it go because they want to keep the process moving along. And Julian Assange stood up, and I won't go over it all again, but basically the statement was a complaint about not being able to participate in the proceedings, not hearing, not being able to follow along, struggling to concentrate related to those kinds of issues. That's when he stood up to speak and, and, and be concerned about the way that the proceedings were unfolding. Where do we go from here? We have a case management hearing on April 7th. That's going to be a couple hours. It's nothing major, but there's going to be some issues worked out around witnesses and the kind of security that might be involved and whether witnesses are going to testify anonymously behind a screen, who's going to be permitted to do that. The defense will have a chance to contest the kinds of security that might be imposed on witnesses from the prosecution. And they'll also have a chance to uh, haggle over the way witnesses will be managed during the upcoming evidentiary hearing in May and June that's going to last three weeks. And it's going to be a chance for both sides to call witnesses and make their cases and and go beyond the legal arguments. I, I stress that what we heard this past week was a lot of legal arguments. We heard about case law. Some of it was very weedy. Uh, it was easy to get lost. Uh, as I described it, you know, your tongue gets dry, your mouth feels parched, your eyes start to dry out too, and you kind of wonder, what does this matter? 
But then you step back and you know that these are the kinds of overscrupulous arguments in which judges seek refuge in mm. order to justify their ultimate decision to allow Julian Assange, a journalist, to be extradited to the United States. And so I think the nice thing about the upcoming evidentiary hearing is we're going to be able to get into things that people can relate to because they've heard. We're going to raise examples of interference and abuses of power by the Trump administration. We're going to get into journalists who have a record of working with WikiLeaks on these disclosures who can attest to the fact that WikiLeaks was careful and did actually care about the names of people and not hurting individuals when they publish documents. We're going to hear from experts, including people like, I don't know that Noam Chomsky is going to testify, but there's going to be professors who testify and or there's going to be statements that are read into the record. And Noam Chomsky is definitely somebody who submitted expert testimony to this case. And they're going to put this in a context for the judge so that she understands what is at stake or at the very least cannot deny that she was informed about the stakes of this case before she makes her ultimate decision. It is very difficult sometimes to follow the nitty gritty details of these cases. They're complicated, as you say, by design and they get bogged down in weedy legal arguments. That's why it's so important for people like you to be there in court in London digesting this for all of us because I'm just grateful for you, Kevin, because I'm disappointed by the lack of alternative media presence that I've seen at this trial, which I think is one of the most important trials of my entire life. So thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you for being there. Thank you for joining Red Lines today and for staying on the case. We'll continue to request updates from you as it all develops. Thank you, Rania.